of all, I would like to introduce Wanne, Wanne X, who is one of the well, four partners uh, of Public Tora from uh, Mexico City. He's actually Belgian, <coughs> I can say this. He pretends to be Mexican sometimes. Um, and according to his other three partners, he's the most Mexican of the three, of the four. So yeah, I don't know what that says about the Belgian uh, nationality. Um, so Project Tora started in 2006. And um, I must say, Wona and myself, we go a long way. We've been working together. Um, we worked together on the border crossing project. Uh, we, we've been studying somehow together. We worked in the same place. Uh, and we also once tried to visit together, and it was very much on my instigation, I admit, uh, a Legoreta building. Uh, actually, the one which is on the, on the poster here. And uh, he thought I was insane. Meanwhile, uh, I figured out it was not because he didn't want to see the building, but simply because I don't have a sense of time and space. Um, Wanda, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll give you the mic. Thank you, Kester. Uh, my introduction is exactly the same. Me and Kester, we go a long way. We have worked together. We, we have uh, studied together. Uh, we did a competition in Mexico together, etc., etc. Um, the reason why we didn't visit the Legoreta building was since I wanted to go swimming in, in the ocean, which is normally also Kirsten's uh, favorite uh, pastime. So, but Kirsten wanted to drive a thousand uh, miles north uh, in one day to go to go uh, see, no, a uh, hundred miles north, sorry, to, to go and see the, the Legoreta building. Um, since I never give lectures about Legoreta, it's going to be a bit uh, improvised, I must say. Uh, I'll kind of uh, group some projects and uh, some uh, uh, reflections on uh, Legareta and different blocks. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, start off with some uh, unbuilt uh, projects of the office. As uh, Kirsten said, uh, I speak for myself here and for my other three partners. I speak in the name of Productora, uh, uh, for uh, Carlos, Victor and Abel, um, who I work with, uh, who, who, who I work all the projects uh, uh, with. Uh, the first project uh, I want to show you is a competition for a uh, center um, uh, house for arts and culture in uh, Beirut. Um, it, was a, it was a fairly uh, square plot next to an inner city highway, as, uh, as you can see, uh, more or less close to the, to the downtown of uh, Beirut, where we were asked to make a, a theater space, basically a theater space and some uh, movie archives and a space for contemporary art. In one of the very intuitive uh, uh, exploration models, we started working with this idea of a sort of building that could be carried and could be organized by a different set of columns which are standing uh, one uh, line behind uh, the other. And we find, found it kind of intriguing because it created sort of, sort of a, a, an image of a sort of a theater curtain, sort of a filigrane that we thought could be, could be interesting. Uh, here you see a bit of basic idea, and then related a bit to the, to the site, we started working on this part uh, where it was closer to the highway. We brought these boxes closer to each other, so it would become sort of a dense package of columns, while towards the, the, the upper side it became a more sort of open space in which we could organize uh, terraces. Uh, here you see uh, our first uh, image, a bit dark, of this, uh, of this project, uh, and then one of the first models where we could study how like, the sunlight would pass through uh, and, and create like extra lines of, of shadows over these uh, already existing lines. The view from the, from the village, you see here, uh, from, the, from the city center of Beirut, with then these uh, uh, terraces and these very long and slender columns that carry, that carry the, the upper floor of the, of the art center. I will, I will speak about these projects really short, but since I, I understand that some people uh, uh, do not know our work, uh, I thought it was interesting to start with uh, quickly uh, a few, a few uh, four, four short projects to get a sort of idea of what, uh, what we're doing. Uh, the project in Mongolia, everybody or, or uh, some of you heard about this uh, strange project in the north of China where uh, a new city, the new city of Ordos, uh, demanded uh, uh, also a new uh, area, area of uh, housing and in which uh, a project uh, led by uh, Ai Weiwei uh, in, in which they wanted to create a new uh, a project in which, in which 100 young architects from over the world would design each 1,000 square meter villa. The, the area where we work is actually not here, it's like outside of this 
But as you can see, the, the urbanism of uh, this, this new uh, city of orders uh, is not particularly, particularly interesting. Sort of uh, central axis, which here's kind of public buildings, then mid, uh, uh, like uh, high rise, mid rise, and then towards the outskirts, uh, suburban, uh, suburban houses. This is then the, our plot uh, on the first visit in the winter. Uh, imagine all these architects coming out and watching actually the same piece of snow, everybody taking pictures of a different uh, piece of snow. Uh, the same, the same site uh, two months later, uh, literally two months later, when the snow was gone and all of a sudden sort of strange dune landscape appears. It also had moved through the winds. Uh, basically, we understood that the uh, landscape around us would not be uh, the Mongolian desert, would, but uh, 99 other uh, uh, architectural uh, creations. So we tried to, to kind of design a house that would be quite introvert and would be a sort of sturdy, sturdy volume uh, in the landscape. We kind of uh, started off with these uh, square volumes and we tried to cut these lines into it to get air and light into the into the building. So you see a sort of underground level on the left, uh, ground floor level uh, with all the daytime areas and the upper floor levels uh, with the nighttime areas. We kind of thought it was interesting a sort of building in which you would be con continuously uh, confronted with your, with your own building, with your own, fa with your own facade, and you would create kind of this diagonal, always like to kind of have these diagonal views towards this space, while these would be really sort of separate, uh, separate islands in, in the upper floors. That's a building, and at, at, at the night, we can imagine that these lines uh, light up, uh, and the outer volume stays uh, pretty, pretty dark. The Municipal Library, another competition in uh, Argentina, Argentina. Uh, very interesting site. Uh, it's actually next to one of the, uh, at that time, one of the only, build, the only buildings of, of CISA in uh, Latin America. It's this plot in front of a sort of empty area that would become a park. And here we were asked, uh, the competition asked for a, a municipal library, actually pretty uh, low amount of square meters uh, on, a, on, a, on a huge plot. So we kind of immediately understood that we wanted to kind of use this area, which is actually also watching towards the south, which is the, the, the site with less uh, solar incidence on, that, uh, on the, the southern hemisphere. So basically we cre created a very undeep building in which like uh, one could read actually most of the of the year, most of the days, without any uh, 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 artificial light. It's only, I think it's a 10.8 10, 10 uh, meter uh, deep strip, which would kind of then finish that area off. And towards the other side, we pushed in all the elements that couldn't fit in this, uh, in this very small uh, strip. Uh, like, for example, the uh, big auditorium, uh, ludoteca, like a child's play area, uh, and a small movie theater. The facade from the side of the park and then here how the, how the building actually works as a sort of large uh, bookshelf uh, uh, towards this, uh, towards this south, southern side. I'll go through them a bit quickly to have a sort of understanding. CAF, the corporate headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela, a very important project for our office. It's a competition we won in 2008, and it's actually the, the uh, biggest uh, project we've, uh, we've worked on. It's, as you know, the situation in Venezuela is not ideal, so the project is in a, in a dubious, or rather say, on a pause since, uh, since uh, a month or so. Um, the site is very interesting. It's this site. On this site, this, actually, when we started this building, it didn't exist anymore. It's an old theater building, and we were asked to develop uh, more than uh, 60,000 square feet on, a, on this area, a corporate uh, headquarters for a financial uh, institution. Uh, which, of course, is a very difficult task, because as you can see, like a sort of urban layout, all these buildings, they look towards these spaces, and you, you know, you feel these have to be a park. This would be a square in relation to the other square, a uh, historic square, with an obelisk uh, a present from the government of France to Venezuela from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so we started to kind of see how, how we could make maybe a solution. Uh, as you see in the upper uh, examples, we said maybe it should be a sort of floating volume, a la Lina Bovardi, you know, so we can have like space free, uh, we can have space free for, or may, for uh, public use, or maybe we could separate the building so we can have uh, people crossing that area. Uh, 
the options, uh, it, it, it seemed very difficult to, to resolve it. In the end, actually, the, the simplest uh, solution seemed to be the, the correct one, to make a building with a uh, footprint as small as possible. So it's a building with a 27 by 27 meter uh, uh, footprint, uh, which is very little uh, uh, per, uh, to make it economically feasible. Uh, but it was uh, just possible. Uh, we, we believed it was just uh, just possible, and we believed it really uh, was a sort of enormous quantity. Instead of using uh, quality, instead of using uh, the allowed 60% uh, of the of the surface of the plot, we only uh, could uh, use uh, we only used 14%. Uh, we kind of imagined that this tower, this building, would stand uh, halfway on this hardscape on this active plaza in uh, Caracas and half in this more lush uh, landscape of a, of a green park. This diagonal that would kind of uh, emphasize as much as possible these this two different uh, conditions and have as much as possible like contrast between these two different conditions. Um, as you see, there's a small building next to it. Uh, that's the, the base. That's a sort of more public building. And it's also the base of an additional uh, tower that they could build uh, in a second phase. We imagined that these buildings are to a certain height in a building, I don't know, maybe five, six or seven floors, there's a sort of direct relation with the street, which was going on on the street. <laughs> and from a different height on, uh, you have more relation with, with the city as a, as a landscape. So you can see it there until like the, the, the I actually have this. Uh, so uh, here you have a sort of relation to the street, while from the floors above, you have a sort of relation with the city more as a horizon. Of course, this, this idea of making this, uh, this uh, monolithic volume standing on this as, as slender as possible open structure uh, was realized with sort of perforated, sort of double facade. Um, and actually, it's a very simple architectonical trick, a trick a lot of architects use, because basically it, it allows the client also a lot of flexibility if at a certain moment. Yeah, actually, here, me speaking through the microphone, okay. So if it's at a certain moment, offices become terraces or terraces offices or offices archives or, or machine rooms, it, it actually is all possible and actually your architectonical image of your building uh, stays uh, protected in one way or another. For the competition, we gave in sort of in, in these images a sort of idea that it's sort of uh, structure, grid, lines, or whatever, that farther you, one would go away, how more abstract they became, so the building would become this kind of... Uh, monolithic uh, volume in, uh, in, the sk in the skyline. A bit of uh, exaggeration with the Photoshop of, uh, in the office. And then the further elaboration of the project uh, in, in, in uh, later stages. I won't go into too much detail since it's on hold anyway now. So. Uh, but the use of color, the use of vegetation uh, was very important. The use of uh, the integration of the arts. So we kind of retook a lot of classical, a lot of themes from the from the Latin American modernism, and we integrated them again uh, in this project. We think they would be still very valid. Uh, of course, they're bankers. They were very afraid of the yellow floors, but uh, we, could, uh, we could convince them uh, in the end. Um, to kind of introduce this relation with Levaretta, and I must say I was very happy when Kirsten asked me to, to participate, uh, not only to come here, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for that, but also to, to talk about Levaretta. Um, and to introduce a bit, uh, uh, because Legoretta is, uh, is an architect, uh, uh, I think there's a sort of short list of buildings. Uh, I always uh, take people to, uh, to that visit me in Mexico, and I think the Camino Real uh, in, uh, in, Mexi in Mexico City is one of, is one of these. To kind of introduce this uh, to uh, Legoretta is uh, in 2010 we did an exhibition in Brussels called Mexican Modernisms, in which we kind of uh, talked, so gave a sort of a I say that bloom lazing, sort of uh, uh, of selection, sort of intuitive selection of uh, of uh, uh, Mexican architecture, in, we, in which we would not place uh, Baragan Central, but in which we would kind of also highlight a few less uh, known figures, like for example David Munoz as the, the building, the inner, inner patio you see of the uh, Unidad Profesional. the airport, the old airport of Acapulco by Mario Pani and Enrique del Moral, with his beautiful. Uh, uh, Celosia, this, this uh, open facade, uh, one of the buildings of Legoreta, then the, the Ixtapa Hotel. And, and for example, this is a very interesting building of Augusto Alvarez. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was a sort of building that uh, it, it, it's a small bank building with this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, light structure on top of it from the, from the 50s. Um, I don't know, it's, 
I think it's from 52 or something. Uh, from 1958, and it's, it's just a sort of a Mission box and a Venturi all in one. You know, it's sort of a, uh, uh, an interesting example. So this exhibition we did in Brussels, basically this is one of the uh, images of the, of the exhibition. You would have uh, sort of documentation on, on, these different, uh, on these different projects and actually have a sort of exhibition room in which no graphics, no, no text would be, would be present. You could only kind of uh, uh, go to one of these images and kind of try to, uh, if you would be interested, uh, like kids playing memory, kind of find a book with the same image uh, on, the, on the table and, uh, and, and get more information. As you see in that exhibition from Legoreta, we had the Automex building, we had the Selanese Tower, and we also had the Ixtapa. I will mention these three uh, again uh, in this presentation. On the other hand, apart from these images, we kind of had in this, in this, in the other room, a very simple setup in which a few videos. We asked uh, young architects, uh, uh, colleagues, to talk about uh, their these canonical buildings, canonical buildings of Mexican architecture, and basically we tried to make sort of the most minimal type of uh, video rooms we, uh, we, could, we could think of, so they would only be defined by just a sort of one wall and one floor that could define a sort of space, uh, three different spaces in that, uh, in that room. When you talk about Lega Oreta, there, um, there are actually uh, two really interesting buildings. Uh, Lega Oreta had a very interesting start of his career, and actually most of the buildings we will talk about today will be about this, uh, this initial part of his career. Uh, because at a certain moment he, he became, an, he, he jumped scale, he became much more international, he became much more commercial, uh, and he lost, uh, it, to my uh, opinion, also a bit his, uh, his, uh, his, his uh, edgy, his, his power, powerful uh, architecture. And the first book is a book that was published in 1989, that's the one on the left, by uh, the, the University <laughs> of Mexico City, the, the UNAM. Uh, that's also the university where Legareta studied. He finished there in '54, and he basically started working for uh, José Villagrán. José Villagrán was like the, the, the grandfather of modernism in Mexico, uh, a guy from the same generation as Barragán. They were both born around uh, the, the change of the century. Uh, and in this book, uh, so you have to understand, uh, Legoreta finishes his school more or less in the, in the uh, 54, in the, in the middle of 50s. He works with uh, Viagran, and uh, in uh, 1960 or 1964, it depends a bit uh, what, uh, what you read, but 1964, he, uh, he starts uh, working on his own projects, starts working on big projects. Uh, he, he does his most important project, according to me, already in, in the beginning of the time, in 68. He does two very important projects, but he doesn't public, publish one book until 1989, so that's almost, uh, yeah, 60, 70, almost 25, 30 years later after opening his office. You know, we all like our young architects, we all publish a book like, I don't know, like six, eight, ten years after we finish the office. So a lot of time goes over it. A lot of projects were published, so there's also sort of very specific selection. He only puts 14 projects in that, for, in that, uh, in that first book, uh, which are actually uh, this one, and as you will see, it's a very specific selection of projects in which he really tried to, uh, tries to reinvent himself uh, as a sort of, uh, as, a, as an architect that fully uh, is integrated in this idea of critical regionalism as, uh, as proclaimed by, uh, by uh, uh, Frampton, who has been uh, writing on, on, on Legoreta. So one of his important buildings, according to me, the Selanese, uh, which we will talk about later, is not included uh, in, in that book. Um, and then the, one of the other interesting books is actually a, a book that was published uh, in 2010. Uh, Legoreta died in 2000, uh, it was published in 2012, I'm sorry, uh, just after uh, Legoreta's, Ricardo Legoreta's uh, death. Um, and it, con it contains, it actually ha should contain three interviews uh, with uh, Legoreta, uh, done by uh, uh, Miquel Adria and Jose Castillo. Uh, uh, but uh, he died before they could realize the third interview. Uh, he died of cancer at the age of, uh, of 80. But it's very interesting because it, uh, it has a sort of, uh, it gives a very direct uh, testimony uh, of, uh, of his work. We'll come back to that anecdotal part uh, uh, later. 
So in this traditional modernity of 1989, there are like three projects we will talk about, and there's another project, the Selanese, which is this one, which is not included in the book, uh, because of course uh, that's, his, that's his most modern project in, in, a, in a sort of, uh, in a sort of uh, traditional, uh, in, in sense of traditional modernism. And at that time, in 1989, he already wanted to be associated with the Baragan culture. The uh, Baragan exhibition was just uh, organized in the MoMA. Baragan won his Pritzker Prize a year later. Uh, Kenneth Frampton was writing critical regionalism, so this building was not relevant anymore. He knew that he could not. Uh, but it's a very beautiful building. It's a building uh, that uh, is based on a hanging structure. Uh, of course, certainly not one of the first uh, buildings with hanging structures uh, in the world. Uh, he kind of looked to what was happening on an international scene, and he started to uh, build this building with this uh, concrete core uh, and with these metal cables. Uh, a building form that, that, had, that uh, had been experimented with before already in, uh, in different other places. The interesting part, uh, the interesting part of this, uh, is this building uh, is that in this tower, what Legareta does, you can see it a little bit here, he steps every part of this uh, almost uh, swastika-like uh, floor plan, he steps it 90 centimeter up. You can see it here in this... Uh, uh, in these floor plans. So basically, uh, and it's very smart, I don't know why it's never been done uh, later, uh, it, it basically creates one continuous office floor. So he could offer his client at that moment, it was for one single client, it was not to be rented, he could offer him one single office floor, uh, sort of spiral, uh, in which he could then grow or decrease his uh, departments. Because as we all know, if you have different floor slabs, if you have a, an apartment, a department of uh, have background music. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that that um, uh, if you have a department that's one and a half floor big, that's always a sort of problematic situation. Uh, very interesting is also to see how he resolves the ground uh, the ground floor. He has this kind of inclinated this this uh, uh, oblique concrete slab. And I must honestly say, although I've passed there a lot, I don't really know what this this kind of uh, the, the structure in the back is a sort of, a, I think, sort of tension structure that seems to go over the, uh, this uh, space in the back. Um, and then there's a Hotel Camino Real. And the Hotel Camino Real is from exactly the same year as the Salanese. It's also from 1968. Uh, but it, it defines already a completely different uh, Legoreta. And it's, I think it's one way or another, it's also the, like the full, uh, when he started to, uh, get rid of his master of uh, 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 Biagran, he starts to be interested in a different kind of architecture and starts to meet other people. Uh, that's also where he met uh, Luis Barragan. Uh, you have to understand, Legoreta was 30 years younger than Barragan, so it's a completely different uh, generation. Uh, and for example, at the Camino Real, he starts to work with Barragan and invites him to, to take care of the, of the gardens, uh, which is a bit of a strange uh, task to give your like, master, you know, to come in as a gardener in, in, in your project. And he also, he also at that moment already knows uh, uh, Matthias Göritz, a good friend of Barragan, uh, 15 years younger, so bit in, between, in between them, uh, this uh, German, uh, ex uh, German uh, artist who lived uh, most of his life actually in, uh, in, in Mexico. Here you see, for example, the Automex, uh, the Automex uh, factory, uh, in which he collaborated uh, already many years before the, uh, five years, five years before the Camino Real with Göritz in the, in the design of these towers. Basically, these towers were sort of excuse. Uh, this very horizontal uh, car factory uh, needed a, a, a water tower and that was a kind of taken up as an excuse to kind of uh, design a sort of auditorium underneath it and to have a sort of, basically he needed sort of vertical sculptural elements to give that building, which is actually a very, uh, a very plain um, functional building, to give it a sort of uh, plastic quality, uh, let's say. Um, so, uh, here we come to the Camino Real. And the Camino Real Hotel was, was built for, for 68, because in 68 Mexico City organized the Olympic Games. Uh, I won't go into all the, uh, the political uh, details. Uh, but basically, whole Mexico City was under construction. They were doing huge works, not only on the avenues, but also on the, on the, uh, the different stadium, uh, stadia, etc. 
and in a record time, as we uh, and, and that's something that I should talk about in relation to, to our work as well. Um, if I working in Mexico City is, is a fantastic place to work, but there's a sort of oh, there's a sort of uh, there's, a, there's a space with a lot of constructive freedom, but there's always an enormous time pressure, an enormous uh, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a certain type of difficulties in construction. Uh, which also, for example, in this case, Lego Red has struggled with. So in a record moment, we had to build uh, 750 room hotels. And at that time, hotels were in general vertical buildings. The hotels that were built at that time in Mexico City were, were uh, vertical. That was like modern, that was a standard. Uh, and he's, he kind of understood that he will never be able to finish. So he says, uh, he says let's build out of uh, bearing walls. And we built everything in brick with local brick workers and we can maximum do five floors. If we do five floors, then we can make bearing walls without too, money, too much uh, extra support. So that kind of defined the height of this uh, Camino Real. Um, in the booklet, in the, in the small booklet with interviews with, interviews, uh, with Lego Reta, he talks about this hotel. Uh, he talks a lot about this hotel uh, because that's also the hotel where he not only started working with Luis Barragan and, and, uh, and Matthias Görit, but he also invited Calder and Tamayo and Pedro Friedeberg and a, and a whole international and national scene of uh, architects, uh, artists uh, uh, that he became uh, that he became close with. In this same booklet, uh, the 2010 booklet, one of the first images you encounter is this this, uh, this line of anecdotes. You no, know, this kind of when when they go and interview Legareta, he prepared a small list of anecdotes of uh, things that he think uh, he should tell. Uh, and it's it's very it's very interesting to see how this book is like structured uh, on on this series of anecdotes of. Uh, and it's also interesting to see how. Uh, also, a lot of this, of this Mexican architectural culture is based on a sort of oral culture. Uh, there's much less, um, uh, much, much less uh, registration. There's much less uh, written work. Also, I mean, I see normally when I look around uh, to my European colleagues and friends, there, there are people, a lot of people write a lot, a lot of people are involved in writing. In Mexico, like all this. Uh, Mexican architects uh, we know, uh, including uh, Proctora. Uh, we write, I, I write a little bit, but I write not, not so much. But Mauricio Rocha, uh, Alberto Calac, uh, even Tatiana, Derek Michel, there's actually not a tradition of writing. Uh, there's a sort of an oral culture. And it's actually interesting, uh, I've, uh, it's actually interesting to see how, like a lot of this history of Mexican architecture, uh, is like uh, told uh, uh, in a sort of uh, uh, as a sort of anecdotes, jokes, occurrences. Uh, occurrences. Uh, for example, there's there's a very important part of Mexican architecture that also has to do with the architecture of um, of Teodoro González de León, who built finally all these brutalist buildings with walls, floors, and and ceilings all in the same hammered concrete. Uh, and, and, and the story says it, got, it started. It's, it's hard to see for you from there, but it started with this, uh, with this building, the Cupa, the, the Miguel, Miguel Aleman housing by, by Mario Pani, who through some mistakes in construction, they had a very poor quality of concrete. The concrete kind of the, the formwork like galloped out, and he said just chip it away. And he kind of understood that the only way to finish in time was just to accept it. And he said chip all the concrete, just hammer it, hammer it, hammer it, and we kind of have a sort of uniform sort of uniform, uh, uh, uniform texture that we can kind of uh, sell as a final product. Uh, on the right side, I put this image of the, of the opening of the opening ceremony. Because at that time, at that time when Legoreta was trying to finish the Camino Real Hotel, um, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez, at that time the big uh, architect of the, of the government, was also finishing a lot of work for the uh, Olympic Games. And one of the stories is that uh, the, 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 the wrestling mats no, they, they have a certain quality because I don't know. I mean, I'm not a wrestler, but people have to wrestle and you have to fall and you have to fall more or less soft. And seemingly at that time, there was a sort of Oli uh, Olympic committee that would come and would drop an egg like from about 40 centimeters high on these mats. And if it didn't break, then that the quality of the mat was like, OK. Unfortunately, these mats, they came from Finland and in the boat the process of salinization, they kind of made them super hard when they arrived at the harbor of uh, Veracruz. So when they arrived in Mexico, they were like sort of 
super hard res wrestling mattresses, which, which of course not pass the, the test. So Pedro Ramirez, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez was thinking about it. He said, I know what we have to do. He said, we have to cook the egg. You know, we have to kind of cook the egg. So then that's the way, that's the way they will pass through the commission and we get another, we get another, I don't know, we win another. Uh, and and this, this, this Mexican, uh, there's, there's this, uh, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez also said to the government, what are we going to do? Because we, do, we want to have like the, sell, the selling the tickets for the 1968 uh, Olympic Games was also a really problematic issue. Uh, because where can we find uh, a group of maybe 200 to 500 honest Mexicans that do not like sports? because they should be in charge of the distribution of the tickets because the percentage of the tickets was for the normal people and it should be distributed in a sort of honest, equal way. Uh, so he kind of then had the idea. He called in the nuns of the monastery of Baragan, the Capuchinas, and they were in charge of the ticket distribution to the... So there was a sort of kind of inventivity, which I think is, is, a, is, a, is a very beautiful, uh, very beautiful. All these anecdotes and introductions actually to come uh, back to what we were actually trying to talk about, which is maybe sort of the key project in, in the talk, the, the Camino Real, uh, in which um, at a certain moment the American investors would come, uh, uh, the American operators actually would come. Uh, the investor was uh, partly also Banamex, uh, which was uh, the, the National Bank of Mexico, which was uh, the cousin of Legareta was in charge of the National Bank at that time. That's, that's why he got this, uh, he got this commission. And uh, Legareta, at a certain moment, had to finish uh, uh, one of the first rooms. Uh, there was only one day left, and there was no way that they could do all the plaster work in time. Uh, so the, they told the plaster works, do it however you can. And they kind of did this very rustic, this very quick stucco work where you just throw the plaster on and then go over it once with your uh, metal scraper, and they left it the way it was. Uh, that, that kind of strange incident became actually not only the, the solution for the Camino Real Hotel to finish it in time and to finish it uh, in cost, but became actually the whole trademark for the whole Legoreta's uh, style of working and, and, uh, and the way of, uh, for his whole uh, uh, oeuvre. Uh, it's interesting because Legoreta at that time, if you imagine a, a luxury hotel from the 60s, uh, the title of the little booklet, of the last booklet, is called Luxury, The Luxury is in the Space Itself. And Lagoret explains it like when he was doing these uh, hotel rooms. At that time, hotel rooms, they would have a sort of very nice marble floors, a sort of wooden, uh, how do you call it, lambrisering, a sort of wooden woodwork around the walls to make it luxurious, nice lamps and stuff. And he basically said, instead of making a one um, a, a hallway of 1.5, uh, meters, I can make hallways of 2.5 or maybe sometimes 3.5 meters for the same cost. He calculated the linear cost of a hallway. But I can give a lot of space and I give really cheap materials. At that time, it was, pretty, uh, it was a pretty uh, revolutionary uh, talk. Actually, a lot of people didn't like it. Uh, um, but uh, it became actually the trademark of, uh, of this hotel. Um, it's interesting to see because this is, this is, what, this is one of the lobbies with a, with a mural of Tamayo, man looking into infinity, uh, and the spaciousness of all these uh, of all these uh, interior lobbies of the Camino Real, and the way they're connected. Actually, you cannot see it so, so good in this picture, but they're all connected on half levels. When you when you read the interview with Legoreta, all these things that people in the interview uh, kind of uh, want him to explain because they really think it's beautiful the way they're so horizontal, where they're connected always, all these hallways are connected on half a level, Legoreta always kind of explained them as a sort of very pragmatic reason. He said, yeah, they were on halfway because between one street and the other street, on the other side of the block, there was a height difference. That's why, that's why they, they started to, to switch half a level, etc. He also talks about the patios. They were there because at some patios, there were already existing trees. So basically, that's how he kind of divided this 750-room hotel into a group actually of six or seven hotels that were connected by, by corridors. If you come to Mexico City, one of the most amazing things, of course, of this uh, Camino Real Hotel is this uh, uh, fantastic fountain. I think we've been there now four times, three, four times, standing in front of it. Uh, it's, it's a fountain. It, actually, it's also a very strange fountain because it, it changes its mood. In the morning, it's very, it's very, it's like this. And after three o'clock, it becomes a sort of smoother, soft thing. 
And the beauty of these fountains, fountains, they're normally always like sort of lyrical and beautiful and romantic. And this fountain is really aggressive, scary. Uh, it's a sort of open sea, you know? Uh, it's, it has a sort of, it kind of injects water on one side and kind of pulls water out on the other side. And it's, it is, it is really uh, sort of this fountain, this, this half a sphere of white marble in this kind of uh, pentagon uh, form. Uh, it's very beautiful. This is how you see the. This, this is an older picture, but it's how you see the fountain nowadays with this with this uh, picture. This uh, Matthias Göritz uh, uh, lattice work in front of it is a sculptural entrance uh, and the yellow wall. But it was. It used to be. It used to be a whole black and white space in which this at the opening of the of the hotel it was a black uh, uh, frame and the whole space was white with white marble. With Legareta later said that he thought it was too aggressive uh, and he, he, he thought it was too conceptual, too intellectual and he changed it, uh, he changed it into color. Uh, actually in this 90, in the first book, the 1998 book, you see these both images, uh, you see actually the opening, I mean it's, it's a black and white image of course, but, but you see that it's a dark, it's a dark space and these, these things are still, still white and you have this fountain. He also has the fountain here on the on the, on the smooth, the smooth, soft, uh, the soft mode, no? And here you can still see one of these older images uh, when this is a sort of a more wide abstract space. There was a whole discussion about that because the hotel operator said, no, a hotel is a sort of uh, a thing that welcomes you with open arms. It should be a beautiful welcome entrance. And, and he said, no, my idea is that you come into a patio that's so scary that you kind of jump into the hotel like afraid and that's where they welcome you with open arms. So it's a, um, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting story. I, I jump back a bit to, to my work and I try to make some, uh, some connections about, uh, uh, about this, uh, maybe in a certain way also about this pragmatism, uh, this pragmatism that, which I think uh, is, is, uh, is always present, I think, in, uh, in a building in, uh, I, I guess, everywhere, but uh, I think in Mexico in, in, a, in a very particular way. This is, for example, the sort of a new uh, a, a call center, basically, in, 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 when in these spaces you have like uh, hundreds of people sitting there trying to sell you credit cards by, by telephone. And it was a building with an uh, enormously reduced cost and we basically had to concentrate on this, on the structure, which is very banal, in a sort of, sort of facade that would make it, would be industrial, it's a sort of industrial area of Mexico City, but at the same time could be elegant. So the, the cheapest material uh, one of the cheapest materials we could find was is just a rolled uh, steel plates, uh, which uh, had a width of I, I, I don't uh, uh, remember wrong, like 72 centimeters, which we could then use in different stripes. And just by opening some stripes with glass and having some stripes again closed, we, we thought we could create a sort of more elegant uh, facade in which, like this open closed, would uh, would kind of uh, inter interchange. Uh, you can see, I mean, I don't see if you see the details, it's not, it's not really Swiss detailing, uh, but it's really sort of industrial uh, detailing. Uh, here see sort of uh, the effect, how kind of this kind of uh, industrial box could have a sort of uh, elegant atmosphere uh, through this continuous uh, uh, change of, of uh, open and closed. And how then, for example, also we try to kind of incorporate uh, these doors in a sort of a clumsy way within the same uh, relentless rhythm of, uh, of opens, open and closed. Uh, Celeste uh, Champagne and Tea Room, sort of weird project we had to do on the, on the, on the top of this house. Uh, this house would be a sort of a strange mixture of, of shops and beauty saloons, but on the top they wanted to have a sort of a champagne bar. And we said it's a very small project, it's sort of terrace-like atmosphere. They just designed one simple tile a 20 by 20 centimeter cement tile and with this tile we can kind of reorganize the whole space. So uh, basically what we, what we did, we said we have these tiles with sort of diagonals which we of course we can connect them into sort of continuous lines and if we then for example turn one of these around they kind of connect again so they kind of, uh, they kind of allow us to kind of create all kind of more like amorphous uh, lines going through the space or maybe even sometimes make crosses or all kind of uh, yeah, kind of little squares, you know, like uh, so, so, so with one simple gesture trying to resolve this, uh, this thing. Now, if you do that then in a sort of, not only on the floor or on the surface, but on a sort of, uh, uh, in a three-dimensional way, 
then these things become a bit even more complex because things like go on the floor, turn around, come with the wall, and actually it creates a sort of uh, sort of busy busy pattern. Uh, we kind of explain to the client that we at a certain until a certain height we could imagine it was full of these busy lines. Uh, that's an image we use to convince the client of the project, you know, like sort of lines and tables, uh, legs of tables and chairs, uh, and above that it would be sort of quieter, quieter space, you know. So here you see that area. The client then never got the quieter space, so he started hanging all these animal heads uh, everywhere. But basically, that's that's uh, uh, that's the idea of how this space. Ah, that's the idea of how this space works. Thank you. Tell me because I forget. I mean, all wired up on. The, all side. Um, the house in Valle de Bravo, um, a house with it, uh, a nice location just in front of a, of a lake. So we immediately said, let's try to, to use, uh, the, the site had a bit of a, a different uh, sort of topography. So it, let's try to make sort of long volume so all the, all the space have mu as much contact as possible with this view towards the lake. And we kind of, uh, we kind of step it down uh, to kind of organize uh, this high difference between the, the street and then, uh, and, and then the, the lake. Um, in this case, we could also create terraces always in, on top of the, of, the, of the volume below. From the street, this house looks very different. It's uh, sort of uh, to comply with certain urbanistic reg regulations. Uh, it has like small openings. It has even this kind of roof, uh, sort of traditional uh, Roof. This is sort of a, it's actually basically a concrete roof under which we screwed sort of wooden, uh, small wooden elements. You, know, you see this kind of pecho de paloma, it's called, and then these small openings and this natural stone. And then when you when you enter the house, a sort of more complex uh, uh, situation. You get confronted with a more complex situation. It's actually basically also, uh, for example, when I see uh, uh, when you enter, for example. Uh, uh, the Baragan house or something similar thing happen when there's a sort of very sort of dull facade on the outside, which then becomes like uh, a, a sort of more complex speciality evolves when you get into the into the space. Uh, here you see then the stacking of these different volumes, actually sort of basic, sort of very basic uh, modernist uh, rectangular boxes who are kind of organized uh, one on top of the other, creating then this. Uh, these extra entrances and cross ventilations through the through the space. And of course the detailing in which we can then kind of uh, build a slab, concrete slab on top of the other concrete slab in order to, to enhance the effect of these different stacked boxes. And of course in Mexico one of the things that's fantastic that also uh, you can see that also in, in the in the in the, in the work of, uh, of all the architects working there is the way, the way you can like uh, easily detail and work things out on site with, uh, with the local uh, craftsmen, carpenters or iron workers. Uh, we don't have this big uh, uh, we kind of When I started working in, in uh, Mexico City, I uh, as, as trained as Kirsten in, in a Dutch office. I first started making all, my, all the folders where all the paper would work would go into and then I discovered there was not actually there was not paperwork to fill to fill these uh, uh, these uh, these folders. Um, talking about topography and talking about the, the one of the uh, fantastic project by uh, uh, Legoreta, the Hotel Camino Real, in which basically he follows he follows the topography. Uh, we can come back to this uh, to this image later, maybe. But uh, he follows the topography of a, of a site. They chose by boat, going through around the coast by boat. They chose a, a site with a sort of secluded beach, and uh, basically he kind of built a sort of building that would follow this topography, and would kind of create uh, all these different rooms. Uh, and instead of kind of this this modernist object that would kind of have this uh, contrast uh, to nature, sort of these lines that run parallel between the existing topography and the new, the new line of the building. Here you see it, uh, in which every room has a sort of small terrace. Uh, let's see if I have it here as one of his sketches where he has a sort of view towards the ocean, sort of sun space. Some even have a sort of small swimming pool in the end, a sort of covered space, this kind of uh, terrace, uh, protected, uh, shaded areas, and then the actual uh, bedroom. So there's actually very deep rooms uh, of which uh, actually half of the rooms are inside and all half of the rooms are uh, are, are outside. 
You can see this image also, this one with a sort of new element, which is not uh, present there yet. Uh, and actually, there's a, there's a very uh, interesting project. This is a very small project for a house in Baia de Bravo, uh, the same place where, where uh, uh, I just talked about. It's the same pre, uh, pr there's a project that's a precursor of this project. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small house. It's one, uh, one uh, single-family dwelling. It's this, it's this building. Uh, it's uh, from almost... Uh, uh, seven or eight years before the Ixtapa project. And it's one of my favorite projects, I think, of Legareta, because it's, it's also, uh, it's this project that also tries to resolve with one sort of geometrical gesture, so, so one, one formal element, it tries to resolve a sort of a gesture uh, in the landscape uh, and a sort of very precise geometric definition uh, organize the whole space. This is the, this is the, actually I should show the house first. This is the, now this is the house from the, from the outside. Uh, we see this is this wooden shingled roof that is uh, situated in, in the woods, uh, and it kind of uh, there's a terrace cut, cut out of it. This is a very very lousy image. That's the only one uh, I could get from uh, the Legoreta office at that time when we were doing the exhibition. But actually, this is the most beautiful image when you see basically the slope, the slope of the ground, with then this this very uh, simple roof. Uh, also, the organization of the house is pretty interesting in the sense that all the circulations are like. Uh, divided in a very blunt and a very, uh, this is, for example, this is the outdoor circulation when you arrive from below. There's also a small part up there where you have to actually enter this door, which is actually this door you see here, and then you actually enter the house. This is also, uh, this is also the door that the servants have to take when they come up from their uh, spaces below to that, uh, to that area. That's the door, the stairs going to the night areas, and then you have this small, uh, uh, living room in the kitchen, which is actually basically also just one door. Everything is like made of this very simple vernacular material. Uh, you see here this living area, all like these wooden beams, then these wooden shingles on top of it, these doors, these uh, traditional elements. And then there's only this one window, which is a sort of uh, reflective uh, glass, uh, sort of with colocación uh, a hueso, you know, like without any joints, you know, without any window framing, like just placed one next to the other. Um, and then you can see how it kind of creates sort of this, this, this reflection also of the lake uh, in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this same opening. There's a new house uh, we're working on in the same area in Valle de Bravo, and that also has everything to do with the idea of topography. Uh, in this sense, it's not just a way of embracing topography. Uh, how am I doing in time, actually? 45, okay. I mean, I don't want to be like the, the fourth program, or the, the band that plays before Sonic Youth and then gets so enthusiastic and never wants to stop it and, and doesn't leave time for Sonic Youth. So. Uh, that's our client, that's uh, Blas. I mean, is that our client or is that my, that's my, that's my client? Uh, they're both Argentinians. So you know, it looks like a well, it looks like a well, no? Uh, that's Blas. He bought this fantastic plot of I mean, I thought it was a fantastic plot of land in front of the lake uh, until he started to explain me that he really likes flat areas. Uh, it was, uh, he bought this for a reasonable price, uh, but one thing he was really sure of, he, he wanted to have flat horizontal space. I, I had the feeling he kind of bought the wrong piece of land, but at the same time I thought it was interesting to kind of see how we could kind of uh, deal with these different, uh, with, with this kind of opposing uh, ideas of the topography. Uh, so basically what we tried to do, we said we should maybe insert a sort of very simple, sort of very square horizontal surface into this, uh, into this uh, area. Uh, and we could actually, I don't know how to explain it very well, but uh, actually if we, if we turn it 45 degrees, the, the square, then um, let's see if I can do it like this. I mean, if, if you do a sort of ground retaining wall, if the, if the ground pushes there, then of course it, it, it falls. But if you, it's, I mean, you're all, you're all engineers, so you know. So if you kind of put it that way into the mountain, it's like more, it's more, it's more stable, you know, it's, it's, it's stronger. So we said if you push this high point into the mountain, uh, then uh, uh, it might 
we hope, we think, we imagine, we fantasize. It might have sort of structural reason of being. And then it actually it's also nice because then in the other part, it becomes a really high part. It becomes like the Titanic, uh, the king of the, the Leonardo DiCaprio uh, part, where you're like really standing above the mountain and have this view towards the lake. Uh, there is just like always also sort of limit in the budget. So these this structural works would, would, uh, would cost something. Uh, so he said, why don't we do in a sort of first phase we sort of build a very simple house, you know, like with local, sort of local, uh, 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 very simple uh, construction with a sort of a typology of the of, of simple house. Uh, basically, it's actually a bit more complex, a bit like uh, like the Legoreta room. This is like sort of half of it is uh, built uh, is an inside space and half of it is an outside space. So basically, I think maybe we can see it later on a plan. You see the house, this is inside space, it's actually a very small apartment, like a kitchen, a uh, bedroom and a bathroom and a sort of seating area. But basically, most of the time you spend outdoors on this terrace, uh, on the swimming pool. This one is, this part is shaded, this in, inside of the house, and this part is in, in the sun. This whole underground area, because of course he wanted bedrooms for his guests and his friends uh, and a bigger master bedroom in the future. We leave it just as rough construction and we, we finish it up. Uh, five years later, so that's a bit the idea to have kind of this, this, uh, this form, uh, this form, is having sort of in the beginning when you live here, you don't feel that you live in an unfinished house because this you never see these spaces underneath it. It's just you always watch over the, over the over the lake. Uh, you just have these kind of openings in here. At the moment when you start when you start to use them, uh, you you your house gets bigger without seeing. Uh, or even feeling uh, this kind of uh, additional construction. Um, that's a bit hard to see, but basically that's the idea, you know, that you have this small house and it kind of connects to the spaces, to the spaces below. Uh, here you see a bit of uh, the outside space and then the inside space. And of course you have this very beautiful triangular concrete uh, walls uh, uh, and then this other part, you know, where it's really kind of the tip of this space kind of watches over the lake, which is actually a bit, uh, uh, which is actually in that, uh, in that direction. That's basically the same. And the stairway that comes, the stairway that comes down from the parking lot and kind of enters this kind of cultivated horizontal space uh, on the mountain. A pavilion on the Sokalo, uh, a building with it, a few uh, yeah, last year. It's actually the only building we built last year. It's sort of tempor a temporary object. It stood there for three weeks on the main square in Mexico City, the Zocalo Square. And it was asked, it asked uh, us to do something with the idea of migration with the different cultures living in Mexico, in Mexico City. Uh, it had to house an exhibition, but uh, they invited us to do this project uh, a month and a half before the opening of, this, uh, of the culture fair. And at that time, they were still thinking who could be the guy to design the exhibition. So, at, and from the beginning, we knew that there, it would be, it would be doubtful that there actually would ever be an exhibition within this building. So we said, let's try to make a building that, as an experience on itself, it's already something that talks one way or another on migration, on movement, on arriving at the Socalo, uh, less, um, et cetera. So we made kind of this pavilion that would con continuously have a flow of people going around and would bring this, this idea of movement into, into the project. Uh, the roof structure is basically a sort of a triangular structure that kind of brings the loads down to the, to the lateral, to the, to the side walls, which then have to be braced in a sort of correct way. So all these combinations of different layers of uh, wood then create a sort of a texture that almost, almost could work as a sort of a, sort of a uh, yeah, texture, uh, sort of woven or sort of like a basket. Uh, uh, the construction had to be done in, uh, if I uh, remember well, in six days. It's eight meter high uh, object. So basically what we did, we, we had to kind of find out a system uh, in which we could build everything on, on site. This is a picture, I think, at five o'clock in the morning, you know, when people, they could work with three different teams on each and every one of these facades and on the, on the piece in the middle. These are the part of the roof trusses that will be lifted in later. And then basically just uh, working, uh, finishing these flat uh, in a very simple way with nails and wood. Uh, we could lift them up uh, very quickly, connect them, 
and then uh, have the pavilion ready uh, uh, for the opening. This is just a sort of plastic textile on top of the structure to kind of make it rainproof for, for a, a week or uh, three. And then you see basically how it works, how kind of this, this uh, uh, the, the mo the, uh, large amount of people in the busy days could just go through this uh, space while inside more uh, intimate things could happen. Uh, exhibition indeed never uh, happened, but as what they do everywhere with exhibition, they kind of program it with young artist corporations and uh, non-profit organizations that give talks and lectures and workshops. And, uh, some more images of that same of that same pavilion. About this uh, texture then, and uh, the roof structure. I'm going to finish with two two projects. Uh, we uh, competition we recently won. We won the competition in September. Uh, today is the day we give in all the executive drawings for the project. It's a 900 uh, seat uh, theater in Cuernavaca, which is a city about uh, an hour and a half away from, uh, from Mexico City. Uh, you, uh, there was an existing auditorium, uh, which is here, and there's a fantastic archaeological site. To be able to work on a competition which you have to build in front of this uh, pre-Hispanic pyramid is already sort of an amazing, uh, amazing given. But it also has a complication. It means that there could be whatever pre-Hispanic uh, leftovers uh, within every part of the city. So basically what they asked us to do, reuse the existing foundations of this kind of, how you call it, trapezoidal uh, auditorium. Uh, as you see in this, it's a bit of a lousy image, but it's a sort of aerial image. You see this is actually actual auditorium. And you see that the, the structure, the, the size of, the, of this open mount that kind of seeks a relation with the pyramid. It does it in a sort of clumsy way. The, these things don't seem to relate to each other in a, in a proper way. Uh, so basically, we came up uh, with a system in which we would, we would kind of make a correction on these different uh, axes. So basically, basically, what we did, we used the existing pyramid, and we used the existing foundations of this, of this uh, thing. And we kind of, within this sunken triangle, placed the auditorium, this 900-seat uh, uh, sort of yeah, it's not really a full, full-grown theater room. It doesn't have a, a tower, a flight tower and stuff. Uh, it's a sort of uh, auditorium, cultural auditorium. And the entrance, we could place it in front of this, this pyramid, creating that way a sort of direct relation uh, between these, uh, these objects. Of course, we could then create also a sort of outdoor aud auditorium, or if you want, or a sort of place where, uh, for, the first, for the first time, you could kind of get a sort of overview of this uh, archaeological site in a sort of very... Uh, simple way. So here you see a bit the, the idea of this, the build-up of this uh, concrete uh, structure uh, and, and then this, this entrance, this entrance volume that kind of looks for this relation uh, with, uh, with the existing uh, uh, pyramids. Uh, as, as, as you heard before, it's like the schedules are crazy because if you have to win the competition in September and we have to now today uh, have to give in all the uh, actually we gave in all the executive documents except for the foundations because it's not yet sure if we can excavate or not uh, what type of foundation uh, uh, we can use uh, so that's that's pretty uh, textile and community center it's also a project that's under construction for the moment this year we hope to build our first uh, civic projects uh, it's uh, we had a whole discussion about this today. I actually don't have an actual version. Uh, this, this is the project, how it was uh, until uh, three months. But uh, when after giving in the executive drawings, they discovered that our uh, plot only runs to here. So basically, this building doesn't exist anymore. We kind of had to re reorganize. Uh, and it's, it's very common in Mexico, in the middle of the project, we have to re uh, uh, rework everything and it's like it's only with a lot of goodwill from all the parties the architect the contractor the municipality that this project happens uh, because uh, there's of course no money to pay your new project there's sort of a, this is sort of it's it's a very uh, tricky and difficult situation uh, which you you have to have the stomach for it if you want to work in Mexico but it as I said before it also have like it has like other uh, interesting aspects, you know, like that you can work with less bureaucracy in a much more direct way, uh, making much more decisions, decisions on site. Uh, here, see a little bit how it works now in this version. So actually, our, our plot 
is only this small strip. So actually our building also became a small strip. Um, and, and, and what I'm really interested in is uh, in, in, in architecture in general, and I want to sort of make a sort of final note, is then uh, how in this how in this uh, in this work of Legareta, but but also in the work that I'm interested in that I'm interested in doing with the office, partially because because of this uh, uh, because of the high speed which which things have to be developed and with the little precision there is and the little uh, de attention there is for the de uh, details designed on uh, in, in in plan. Um, a yeah, sort of way of working in which I think that the general basic layout, the general lines you draw on paper, maybe actually the first party sketches are what are, should have all the quality of the building. Because the quality of the building can never depend uh, on final materialization or finishing or detailing. Because you will never, you don't have any control over it. Actually for this building, we decided to build the whole building out of concrete, floor, walls and, uh, floor, walls and, uh, and ceiling. Because the, the, the structure, the concrete, everything which is done in uh, concrete is signed off by the structural engineer. That means it has a sort of, uh, it has a val validity. It uh, has to be respected uh, because of safety reasons. While an architect's work, the municipality can change it whenever they want. They run out of budget at a certain moment. They decide to apply other finishing. Uh, there's a contractor that kind of got bribed by another guy to put another material on it. So. Uh, we kind of discovered that our way to resolve it in this case, because we're working here really in a little town uh, uh, in, in the middle of uh, Oaxaca, sort of uh, chaotic uh, uh, province of, uh, of Mexico, we decided to do the whole building in, uh, in concrete just to have the engineer sign it off and to have it as an undeniable truth. Actually, when this building is finished, in concrete the whole building is finished. There's nothing more to be done. And actually, also, uh, some of the stronger buildings of Legareta, they also kind of really, I think, depend on this first uh, uh, party sketches, this first this distribution of spaces. Actually, basically, what you can see uh, in, in, this, uh, in this first construction of the foundation, uh, the foundation beams, uh, for example, you see already the perfect ry the rhythm of all the different elements. Also, this, uh, this, this one uh, oblique line that grows through the building, all these parts which are actually uh, crucial for us in development of this project in the relation with this with this building to this building they're already there from the first moment uh, they start building and I kind of have this this idea that if these first lines uh, these first lines uh, every 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 time a project advances more on the on the design table uh, I get less and less interested because I also know that there's less and less possibility that it that I will have control over these last over these last uh, uh, over these last elements and it's a bit like for example like these archaeological digs for example when they dig up a building uh, when we see these images of uh, pre-modern buildings which sometimes we see these these pyramids or these hippo style halls or this these kind of leftovers of architecture uh, from past times uh, and 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 we kind of have a sympathy for it. We kind of have a feeling there's a strength in it. And I think the way a building is built with this addition of finer and finer detail, both at the building side, but also on your drawing table in, in the discussion with your office, uh, also in that same order, in that same reversed order, a building gets destroyed. First the finishes go away, then the, the, the softer walls, the lighter fixtures. Uh, and basically in the end, uh, what is built first is what it was stays what stays there on the ground sort of division of spaces of proportion of dimensions uh, lying in the grass and that's why I, I, I can believe or I like to think of our architecture also as a sort of building uh, in which this uh, I maybe even like the foundation plans could be like sort of the, the strongest decision are made there in that kind of organization of uh, of space that's one hour and two minutes. Thank you very much for your attention.
Well, uh, I think it's a special uh, DVD because of students that that's never really the case with the difficult double in a way to sort of an interesting overlap. I think you should stress us and um, stop asking at least one or two questions. You know? um, that's the tradition. So I think uh, the beautiful lecture you just gave us also brings us to that. Um, well, I was wondering, Ligoretta, from far away from Mexico, mm -hmm. you have the tendency to connect him with Paragon. And somehow, I must say, until I went to Mexico, I always thought he was a disciple of Paragon. I mean, that should explain he's not, and he explains it with another, another story. Um, my, my question would be, like, what would you see as, as the major difference between the two architects? Apart from the fact that one is considered, of course, far more famous, it's the prize winner and so forth. Is it ultimately, is it ultimately maybe Liberetta much more a contemporary architect? Yeah. No, and of course, I think that the question is, 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 a, is a very important question. It's a question, uh, I think, the, the difficult double of Legoreta is not Productore, of course. The difficult double is Baragan. It always has been Baragan. Actually, Legoreta, of course, he's a disciple of Baragan, uh, but he has denied it his, his whole life. Only like in the, on his, uh, the last years of his life, he has been very open about uh, his indebtedness to, to Baragan. And I would not say to Baragan. I would say to, to a whole group of movements, uh, which was like the movement of the emotional architecture. That's actually the only text written from that uh, from that uh, time on uh, um, on architecture, the uh, emotional architecture by Matthias Goeritz. Um, I, th I think what is, what is one of the biggest differences uh, between uh, uh, Legoreta and Baragan is that uh, uh, yeah, Baragan was a much more uh, spiritual guy, and all his decisions are around uh, spirituality. While Legoreta, as I told you, every question it's all about pragmatism. It's all about, and I, I, I must, I cannot stop feeling that there's a sort of very interesting, and I don't mean that this this uh, uh, disrespectful or something, but it's a very happy uh, coincidence of circumstances that made Legoreta what he is. And I think, I think maybe every architect or architecture is that also a little bit, you know. Uh, Baragan would, for example, say uh, that when you do a house, just do one room, do that good. There's not talent for everything. And I think, actually, I think maybe one of the, your last visits to Mexico, we went to the Hilari house as well, which is the one with the swimming pool in the back. And, and I think that's maybe the best example to see. That's actually, he did one room and sort of walked to that room with his, through the yellow hall with the, uh, and then he has this swimming pool, but the rest of the house is it's nothing. It's just a sort of banal. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, and I think that 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 is really what happens. Baragan has sort of uh, yeah, Baragan was a sort of uh, uh, sort of much more uh, artistic approach, while uh, Legareta has far more ideas uh, about distribution. And you, have, you you can really see all the early works of, of Baragan are. Uh, Office towers, industrial buildings of, of Legoreta were uh, office towers, industrial buildings, manufacturing plants with very uh, high-tech plastic and steel, plastic and aluminium roof structures for the Automex building, for example. Uh, while while Baragan, he started as a garden designer. You know, he started working with uh, trees and vegetation and with colors and with his rough walls. And basically, they they both had this fascination for the for the classical uh, Mexican hacienda, because they were both, both from a wealthy class and they both grew up on these spaces. Every day they had their family houses on the countryside in these neo-colonial, uh, in these colonial uh, buildings, which is huge space with thick walls and deep windows. And so I think that's, that's uh, and it's really interesting how you see this relation, not only between Baragan and Legoreta, but Baragan, Legoreta and Goritz, they have been fighting their whole life about claiming the satellite towers, about claiming the Camino Real, about claiming uh, it's, it's a, it's, it has been a very, yeah, it's a, a very different, uh, uh, yeah, very different thinkers about the way they, they work. Some other question? Only my friends. Silly question. I don't even know 
easy to plant a tree, but I mean, basically you, you studied in, in, in Flanders, no? and then uh, you start working as an architect in, in the Netherlands, no? and you did mm, post. Netherlands, yeah. Yeah, why not Netherlands? So you sort of post the name Netherlands in the 90s and early 2000s. How much did the Mexico uh, change? Because, I mean, uh, I think there were glimpses of that in, uh, in your lectures, like saying mm -hmm. uh, learning to, to improvise you know, mm -hmm. or learning to, 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 to deal with certain approximations. Uh, and in retrospect, I see that uh, uh, in a way your projects uh, became uh, almost more robust, no? more yeah, possible, sturdy. You know, mm -hmm. because they have to bear the sort of Conditions, but yeah, I'm simply curious to understand if there's more or less or what you forgot was your. No, it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting question because also every time I come to Europe and every time I, I meet my, my close friend Kirsten, we, we we study together, we work together, and at a certain moment you think you have a sort of same cultural bagage, you know, a sort of you kind of. Uh, more and more, I'm convinced that this architecture is it it is is so much not a. Uh, 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 it's so shaped by these local co conditions and by this local, uh, and I, I think every time, uh, in a sort of very automatic way, you kind of get steered to some very simple, uh, to kind of other ways of, of working. Um, for example, Mexico City is such a chaos that, I mean, to have a moment of legibility, if you have a building which is clearly legible and like understandable, it's, 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 all, it's, a, sort of, it's a sort of relief to kind of, uh, um, so, so I think there is always a sort of uh, intention uh, to work with a minimum of of, uh, of gestures and also a minimum of detail and a minimum of uh, refinement. I think even because because it kind of disappears. I think in the chaos of the of the context. Uh, and then yeah, there's a whole series of practical uh, practical uh, reason that I think I think we we discussed. It kind of steer you away from from. Uh, other uh, games and tricks that I see that I see happening in, in the uh, in the European architectural scene. I must say, I come here and I'm surprised. I think it's so it's also witty, so so precise, so intellectual. I kind of get jealous of that at a certain moment, you know. Uh, but yeah, there's sort of uh, the sort of there's yeah, there's sort of way of working that is asked, demanded by your by your context. I think. Other question. Book lounge. Well, thank you very much, Roman. Um, You're welcome. Thanks again.